<laughs> it's on. watching this uh, version of Matthew. You know, when people say that the uh, Bible is inerrant and that the Bible says this, and so therefore we must follow this completely, I want to caution you because God still speaks to us today. There are a lot of cultural influences in the Bible that's been written down, a lot, a lot of, of oppression shows there is shows up in there, the eras. And on this one, I was on that Bible translation team at the time. I was an ASL consultant. I was also a bilingual consultant for this version. And I was signing behind the scenes, you know, as a team. We had the uh, Canadian Bible translators, we had people who were watching, overseeing us, because we weren't well-versed. We were just ordinary folks that God had called to come and translate the Bible into ASL. So they were watching us, and this morning, now watching this, I can see some errors in this uh, version. So it's really good to see that the, the writer and the signer have their own personal filters and their own personal translations, their own personal perspectives. And those showed up in this person's signing. And no one caught it. No one caught the errors. And the errors came from their personal perspective on scripture. So what I'm trying to say to all of you guys is be careful. Don't just take things absolutely literally. The Bible says we can have slaves. The Bible says we can't take any analgesics. The Bible says that, that um, shows right here that my race is better than your race. And now looking at this, I saw some of those errors and thought, wow. So I think as the body of Christ, what's critical is that we have to figure out and practice and remind ourselves and each other to keep moving forward to make sure that we understand that all are created in the image of God. All people are created in the image of God regardless of our race, regardless of our facial features, regardless of our backgrounds. We are all created in God's image. And we believers together become the body of Christ. You know, we've talked about that so many times. So I'm going to time out just a moment. But part of my dis dissertation research found that um, I understand better now that the body of Christ has to include absolutely everyone. We cannot marginalize hearing people. If we plan to move forward, we have to figure out the right way that we can include everybody. Absolutely everybody from here going forward. Some deaf people have some hearing, some deaf people like to talk, some deaf people just like to sign only. There's such a variety within the community. And that means that the body of Christ has to include people who can hear too. So, so many people also think that God's work is only for the pastors to do. But we're all learning, we're all progressing, and we're learning that the body of Christ needs to be ready to serve to work and serve wherever we're needed. Last week, Lynn helped someone fill out a form. One of the refugees fill out a form. And that wasn't that easy. It took her time to do that. She had to read and figure it out. And I'm sure it brought her joy to be able to help that person. Service is so important. 
So if any of you want to serve, let me know. I've got a lot of areas that we need help in. So many. And when we move and have a combined service, then we are really going to need a lot of workers, for sure. We're going to need a lot of leadership as well. So as you saw this verse, it says we, as believers who have accepted Jesus as our Savior, who have become Christians, become members of the body of Christ. At the same time, we become salt. What's your sign for salt? There's a lot of different signs for salt. What's your sign from Iowa? Salt? I thought it was this. I thought it was like, touch your lips and then do salt. But maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, that's what my family signed. So salt. We're going to sign it like this. <laughs> I'm a Kansan. So we become salt. So what the heck does that mean? What it means is that we become, as the body of Christ, as soon as we become Christians, regardless of our age or our race or our economic status or our educational level, we all become equal. And we all become salt. <coughs> if anybody has high blood pressure, you know you have to be careful and not eat too much salt, right? You gotta put that salt shaker down. But salt tastes really good. Salt enhances the flavor of food. Everything tastes better with a little salt, right? So we all become equal. We all become salt. We all have to serve within the body of Christ. <coughs> I know I'm saying this over and over again, but how do we know that we're equal? Because Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. There is no difference. No one is subjugated to anyone else. There's no difference between male and female. Because we all become one in Christ. So that's how we know that we're all on equal footing. And anyone who uses scripture to announce and, and say that women cannot yes. preach are misusing Scripture, no question about it. Anyone who says that, oh, well, the Scripture says that my race is superior to that, oh, the races, that person is misinterpreting Scripture, and they're just plain wrong. Anyone who uses Scripture to say that all these folks need to be subjugated are misusing Scripture, and they're just wrong. What this means is when we become Christians, we become salt, which means that salt is really important, especially back in biblical times. It was a preservative. It preserved food. It preserved people's bodies. Salt is really as pressure as oil and gas is today. During biblical times, when Jesus taught that we were like salt, it meant that we were incredibly responsible and incredibly valuable. Because our uh, perspective on salt has changed over the years. We think it just makes us to, makes food taste good and it gives us high blood pressure. But in biblical times, Jesus said, you are salt, which means y'all must be like salt. Because salt was incredibly important during those times. So what does it mean for us to become salty? That means every time that we serve, that we help people, then people can taste that, can taste our salt. For example, that person was so thankful that Lynn became salt as she helped them fill out the form. People became thankful that Abigail and Robin were struggling with the text so that we could do this. Anytime we give people a ride, they became, they taste your saltiness. You know, you don't lick their hands or anything like that and say, oh, I taste the salt on your skin. That's not the kind of salt I'm talking about. What it means is that once we meet someone, then your personality, your grace, your compassion, your mercy that is shown to someone else is giving them a taste of salt. 
the same as when someone shows you the same mercy and compassion and grace. You taste salt. Additionally, we are to become the light of the world. We need to be placed up on a hill so that people can see the brightness of our light shining. That's what we're supposed to be like. So we are supposed to look and behave differently. We are supposed to be so absolutely different that people will notice our light wherever they are and turn and wonder, who is this? And that wherever we are, they will notice and turn to look and be impressed with our light that's shining for Jesus. So once we become a Jesus, we need to shine so brightly that people notice us from their peripheral vision, from far, from near, from in front of them, from behind them, from the sides, that they will notice that through our behaviors, through our responses, through our acts of service, through our joy that they can see. You know, when Adam and Eve ate the apple back in the beginning, humankind lost their saltiness. We lost our light. We just lost it. We didn't have salt or light anymore until Jesus came and brought the salt and the light back to us. So Jesus brought us the salt and the light. He said, you may have this again if you follow me. And my two greatest commandments are that you will become light and salt. And that's a big responsibility, wouldn't you agree? It's a big responsibility. Because we do our best every day to learn how to love God and love people. Which means that if you want to be salt and light, what do you think that means? It means if you see something unjust happening, happening, then you do something. Don't just ignore it and leave it be. When you see someone who does not know how to speak up and defend them, themselves, then you speak up and defend them. Don't just leave them. When you see someone in poverty, share what you've got. When you see someone who doesn't have the necessities in their home, then help them find it. Give it to them, whatever they need. Support the church financially. Don't just be elitist. Means hang out with the folks with disabilities. Because they are very lonesome, they are very isolated, they are very victimized. They can't drive anywhere they want. A lot of people will say, well, hi, how you doing? Good to see you, and then take off. You know, it takes some time. It takes a desire to really attend and build a friendship with folks, regardless of their disability. To be salt and line, the light means that you need to see everyone as your equal. And we've talked about that a lot of time. You know, internally, of course, we all have some of our own yeah, racist feelings. We do. We're not 100% able to love everyone equally. We're all still working on that somewhere. But what it means is that we never bully, and we never make fun, and we never oppress. We never abuse. <coughs> we never take advantage of people. I want to show you a book here. I showed this on Wednesday night. Let me talk about a little bit about this book first. Don't be shocked by this book. Let me explain it. You see it? It's the Book of Joy, Conversations with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. It's called the Book of Joy. written 
uh, the, it's conversations with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu that has been written by a Jewish man. So he interviewed both the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu and then about how to find joy. About where do we find joy? Why are we not always joyful? And they talk about the happiness between, or the difference between happiness and joy. And the Dalai Lama is a Buddhist. He is the leader of the Buddhism in India. He's the chief Buddhist. And then Desmond Tutu just passed away not long ago. I met his grandson. Uh, he goes to Jacob's Church. Um, he's actually from South Africa. And he fought in love against um, against the Civil War, against apartheid in Africa. His daughter from South Africa. flew with him to meet the Dalai Lama in India. And he didn't know that uh, this guy's mother was a priest, well not a Pharisee, was a priest. But the daughter was also a priest in a different church that allowed women. Um, anyway, when the Dalai Lama got to India, his daughter um, married a woman and then they were flying back to South Africa, and the South African government uh, took her credentials away because they were not in support of the LGBTQ community. Anyway, I found that out when I read the book. So I was thinking, huh, why is Pastor Debbie reading a book about Buddhism? What in the world? This book is actually about finding joy. You know, like this morning, we decided whether we were going to choose masks or not. We were going to make it optional. Well, it's the same thing. We don't have the right to decide who's going to hell and who's not. You Indians and Buddhists are going to hell. No, we don't have that right to say that at all. Every great leader in the world has a wonderful interpretation of life, a wonderful perspective on life. And we're supposed to study and learn from them. I'm not asking you to become Buddhist, not at all. No way, we are Christians. We believe that this is the right path. And that was our choice, right? But the purpose of reading broadly is to think, is to find out what Leaders worldwide think about joy. What do they think it is? What, how do they think we get it? What is the point? And the point is that Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama both agree. Of course, you have to read this for a long time before you get to that point. There's a lot of different opinions and perspectives that they share here. They have a few disagreements, and those show up in the pages too. For Buddhism, This Buddhist uh, Lama and the South African priest were both the heads of their religious orders, and they both said, both said that joy is found through service, through service, not through fancy vehicles, not through watching the best movie in the world, not through having a lot of money. And they explained the reasons that those were unfulfilling. And what they both said is, if you want to feel joy, then serve, 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 love, love, love. They both were nonviolent activists. You know, violent activists are the ones who bomb things and blow stuff up. And do not automatically think of Muslims when you think of that. There's a lot of white Europeans and Americans who bomb things too, right? So we can't automatically think of Muslims, because that is a clear sign of racist thought. But the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu were both nonviolent activists. And this book, all the way through, 
showed clearly that the only way to feel joy is to serve in love and be very careful about how you respond. Because as they said, you will always experience challenges. You cannot avoid it. You know, we as humans, we seek to avoid pain, right? Emotional pain, physical pain. We run, we absolutely run away from that. However, these two were teaching us that we need to expect to have challenges within life. We need to expect to have struggles within life. We need to expect to have good days and bad days. Maybe you work two jobs. We expect to have tech to fail. We need to anticipate that we're going to get to COVID possibly. But that's not how, but by avoidance is not how we get joy. We get joy through service for what we do for another human being. And when we do that, we automatically reap joy. And we feel good, and we start to think in a positive manner. And the less we serve, the less we help, the less positivity we have, and the less joy we feel. The book plays it a lot better than I do, of course, and their interviews were really good. But it totally makes sense. Because it all relates to Jesus' commandment. You remember all the 613 rules and regulations and the mitzvahs and all that kind of stuff? You know? But they boil down to love God and love people. Which means we see everyone as equals. We see everyone through the eyes of love. You see, you get touched and you help. And both the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu said, the greatest act you can do during the day is to serve and help. Don't think, oh, today I need a break from service and loving people. I just, I'm done. I just need a break. I'm just worn out. I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. <coughs> I think I'm just going to do me today. But they both said, if you just do you, you're going to get no joy. If you do for others, you will find joy. Isn't that cool? So if you'd like to read this book, it's a good one. It's a very good book. Okay, let me go back to my notes. Where am I? <laughs> so you saw this verse said that the light is not put under a bushel. No, don't put your light under a bushel. Let it be open and free. So do what you do and don't hide. Be free to act. Be free to serve. Be free to absorb joy everywhere you can. Be free to absorb those mental positivities. And if challenges come up, that's okay. Our light does not need to be hidden. We will have challenges in life. <laughs> We're supposed to have challenges in life. We're not in heaven yet, right? But the more we sow our lives in joy and love, the more people can see the kingdom of God is here. So this means that every time we don't love God, that we do not love people, our light dims. You can see it start to dim and flicker. But every time we do love God and love people, our light shines brightly. And we want it to be bright all the time because people need to see. I know there are so many wonderful Christians, there are many wonderful Christians who have a dim light. The light is there, but it's dim because they're so busy judging other people and deciding who's going to hell and who's not. So their light becomes very dim. And they become fearful and they scare other people away from them. However, when you show love to God's people, that's attractive, like the taste of salt, like the sight of light. And then they'll be able to make it through their lives and progress. Isn't that beautiful? People can be so thankful for our lights and our saltiness. People become so filled with gratitude that they praise God 
And that's what we want. We want people to praise God for how we make people feel. That's our desire. Another verse says that Jesus says, I am, did not come here to abolish the laws and the prophets. Now, if you come to Wednesday Bible studies, you're going to see how the Old Testament verses correspond to the New Testament verses and all the correlations between them. Every time Jesus quotes something from the Old Testament or tells a story, he's using the Old Testament. And so they are both so intricately tied. Jesus did not come to say that the Old Testament can just be thrown out. The Old Testament is passe, get rid of it. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the Old Testament. I came to fulfill the Old Testament. That's what Jesus said. So, okay. The stories, the parables, the scriptures, all align. He takes it from the Old Testament, and we see it again in the New Testament. And so what that means is, hold on just a moment. Okay. So what that means is, for us, that means that we need to understand what the kingdom of God is. When Jesus ascended to the Father, Jesus commanded the disciples to go and share the good news throughout the world. That was the, the great commissioning, that we are supposed to continue the work of Jesus. Jesus didn't just go back to heaven and say, oh, well, everything's done, I guess we just hang out and wait for Jesus to come again. No. Jesus came and taught and moved and said, now what I have done, you continue this work on earth while I'm with my Father, getting ready for you and preparing a place to bring you home. Isn't that cool? So it's up to us to continue this work. We don't see that fully in the church, though. I think we're pretty weak. We see too much criticism, too much judgment, too much discrimination, too much abuse, too much bullying, too much selfishness, laziness, anger, greed, which is what we see in the church. And all of that has to stop. It's all wrong. That is all the definition of sin. That is all sin. Maybe you think differently. LGBTQ people are not a sin. Women pastors are not sins. All of that greed and judgment and enmity, etc., that is sin. And Jesus came and preached on that very seriously. Again, the Bible says, If you dis discredit any of my commandments, then you will be discredited within the kingdom of God. You know, when you read this, it can be very overwhelming. We start to think, wait a minute, which commandment? Which commandment? I don't want to be last. Which commandment do, have I discredited? So let me make this simple for you. There's two commandments. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So just spoken on those, on those two commandments, Jesus said, that's all you need to know. I think it's pretty serious if we're not doing those. And I'm not trying to threaten you with hell at all. I would never do that. I'm not threatening you. But I do think that it means that whenever Jesus says, it means that if we see injustice or oppression or racism and we do nothing that's discrediting God's commandments and then God will judge us God's not going to send us to hell by any means but God will he will have the judgment of God on us that's what I believe and the verses go on to say if you're like if you do not live a life in a different manner than the Pharisees, and you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then we think, what? Wait a minute. I think we're going to hell. So I'm going to hell if I don't behave better than the Pharisees? 
that sounds pretty scary. What does Jesus mean by that? Jesus was telling the crowd, you have to do more than the Pharisees, or you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, okay, so where is the kingdom of heaven, anyway? Where is it? The kingdom of heaven is not just a physical place where we live for eternity. That's not all it is. The kingdom of heaven is within our hearts, within our minds, within our souls. That's where the kingdom of heaven is. The kingdom of heaven surrounds us. It's everywhere. Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven here, and it is everywhere. But if we don't surpass the Pharisees, then we won't experience the kingdom of heaven. Because the Pharisees only followed the laws, and that's all that they looked at. They only followed what was written in the law. And Jesus said, if you don't do more than that, if you do not sow love and mercy and compassion, if you do not help, if you do not speak up for those who can't, then you will not experience the kingdom of heaven in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul, and in your strength. And when we do, that is where we find joy. You can see how all of this knits together. How all of these verses don't talk about going to hell. Jesus is teaching us. Jesus is teaching us that if you want joy, do more than the Pharisees did. The Pharisees just followed the regulations, the rules, and the law. So you know churches that say, well, you're going to hell if, you, if your shirt, skirts are too short. You're going to hell if you've got short hair, if you're a woman. You're going to hell if you preach or if you teach this or that, the other thing. If your husband beats you, honey, you have to just respect him and honor him because you're the wife. You cannot file for divorce. And all those type of things. Jesus is calling a big time out to that and railing against it. Jesus says, hey, do more than the Pharisees, and you will find joy. You will be immersed within the kingdom of heaven, and there you will find joy. Only there can you find joy. Only there. Amen, amen, amen. So let's